James was quite a Baptist preacher. His family, he was a, a great, I mean, he was outlawed, according to the government. But the man was, uh, him and his brother, his father founded many Baptist churches. As a matter of fact, one of his sons, as far as I know, one of them was a, ended up a lawyer in Los Angeles, and the other one was a minister, a, uh, a pastor in Los Angeles of Jesse James's uh, family. They, uh, they went around different areas founding Baptist churches, but when the railroads and the banks got together, which they were, it, was, it was high crime, that's what it was, in early America, they did a lot of bad things to the common man. They would, they would take their land away from them. The government gave them so much uh, uh, right away on both sides of the railroad where they would build it, and they were taking people's land, uh, farmland, and they did this, pulled this on Jesse James and his, and his family. And they uh, had fought in the war between the North and the South, you know. And, and uh, anyway, uh, they got a bunch of their comrades, and they started a war against the banks and the railroads. Well, all the people back in the South, in Missouri and Arkansas and, and all of those states, they backed Jesse James and his family. Every place they went, he usually would go to a preacher's home. And he would stay with preachers all down to different places and they'd hide out. And but Ben Bogard said one of the greatest things that ever happened to his life is getting to sleep in the bed with Jesse James. <laughs> he said his big old pistol laid right on his chest all night long. He got, you know, that's he said when he came to Bogard's house, he said, Yes, you can stay with me. And he went in there and he laid down in, in the bed with this boy, and they fed him and everything, of course. And, and of course he gave donations to the church, whatever he he, he was a real Robin Hood, and you don't hear that. You know, we, we see all kinds of, of outlaw movies and the old stories of Jesse James, but this is uh, what really happened. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know if you ever seen some of the escapes and everything that they did, but uh, they could not prosecute Frank or Jesse James. The people would not allow it. They would have hung the judges. <laughs> <laughs> And rightfully so, <laughs> because there was a, a lot, of, even out here in California, when the Southern Pacific one, uh, out here, they uh, advertised all over the East for people to come up down to Tulare, Tulare, Merced, Modesto, Fresno, all where the railroad went through here, in Bakersfield and everything, free land. Take it and, uh, and build your homes and everything else. We'll give you a start and everything else. And then they got out here and when they got the people out here, and they built their farms. As soon as they established them, then they kicked them off the land. Says, "Get out of here, it's our land." And then they would sell the farm to somebody else. Well, these are some of the things you don't hear about. <laughs> but Ben Bogard wrote this chart so many years ago, and that's his uh, some of his background. He, as a matter of fact, a lot of books from the Bogard Press. He uh, was very frugal in his life, and uh, when he uh, when he finally died. He had established a, a seminary in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, had given all of his money all of his life. He was a wealthy man, but he and he raised his children well. And uh, when he died, he didn't even leave a burial plot for himself. And the church that he pastored gave his wife a pension until she died, and they had the privilege, the students said they had the privilege of buying their headstone and a grave plot in the cemetery for them because he didn't leave anything behind. But you can go buy a book today that would cost $40 for $10 from that press because it's that's what they're doing. On church history and, and things like that from, from there. That's, that's uh, uh, one of the legacies that he left behind. Uh, uh, a very... You know, it's interesting, Jim, a man like that, as you're talking about him, uh, and I think of uh, Rupert Murdoch, uh, who owns the copyright for the NIV and also is making millions of dollars on that along with Zondervan publishing it and yet uh, he is in the hardcore pornography at the same time that he owns the copyright for the NIV. I mean charlatans, but make uh -huh. a buck and uh, what a comparison between uh, him and Bogart and yeah. Bernard. Well, Bogart, he left children, but he said, I trained my children right. The most important thing I gave them was the knowledge of the Savior. And all, all of them say they're responsible citizens, and they can take care of themselves. They don't need anything that I can leave behind them. So, 
for them. So that's what he did. Now, the rule of interpretation. How many of you know it by now? You don't have to go through all these five or five here. Who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? And uh, what is the subject? All right. Now, we're, what scriptures, remember I told you last week, what scriptures do you have that have bothered you? Anybody? I'm going to take you to some. We, I, we studied Acts 2.38 and how the history of that word and that, and that scripture. We even studied the, the Church of England stand that... Uh, uh, that translated the King James Version and why that they uh, translated it in such a way. And it does, it teaches what? What does it teach there? Do you remember Brother Ken? In Acts? Uh, how should it be translated? Acts 2.38. All right. Who's speaking there? Who's speaking there in Acts 2.38? Who is the guy? Uh, Peter. Peter. All right, who's he speaking to? A great audience of people that had repented. All right? And uh, they had repented, and it says in the original language, they had stabbed down in their hearts, and that they were extremely sad uh, because of their uh, moral and uh, spiritual condition. They wanted to be saved. And he said, uh, uh, what must we do? And what did Peter tell them, uh, uh, Ken? He said, um, all of you must repent and let every one of you, individual, uh, be baptized in the name of Jesus because of the remission of sins. Ones that had repented. All right? The word there in, in, is in the plural for every one of them to repent. All men everywhere ought to repent. And each one of you that has repented, each individually one of you that has repented, allow yourself to be baptized, and it should be translated dipped in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of course. That because it says in the name of Jesus Christ. That, all right, but what what formula did he give in Matthew 28, 18 through 20? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right, where's another one? We went to John, 1 John 2 and 2. Let's go to Matthew 16 and verse 18. Let's look at this one. Matthew 16 and verse 18. This is a... A very misunderstood scripture. Matthew 16 and verse 18. And unless you get this down, you'll never unlock many, many scriptures of the New Testament and many of the basic doctrines of the Bible when it talks about the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Matthew 16, 18. King James says, And I say, in the, I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's what it says in King James. Alright? Now, first of all, <clears throat> should that word church have been there? What does the word church mean? Ecclesia. It comes from Ecclesia. What? Called out one. One's called out. All right, one's called out. Where does church begin to be called out? Where? When Jesus was baptized. What? Well, after, right shortly after Jesus was baptized. Uh, when he went by the Sea of Galilee, he started calling out the disciples. And that was the nucleus of the church. All right, the assembly. Now tell us a little bit about the word church. Remember that? Any of you guys? Fernando, you remember the, about the word church? Where did it come from? Uh, There's an old Greek word in it. Remember that? What, ecclesia? Oh, yeah, that word ecclesia. It's an old word. What, is that? What, was the, what was the word ecclesia before Jesus used it? It was to mean an uh, independent uh, democratic city. An independent, independent uh, democratic body of individuals in each city that was called out by, from among the populace of the city and elected by them to carry out the uh, laws of the kingdom that they were part of. It was a democratic local body of individuals that were subpoenaed by law and they were. A, it was a lawful assembly of people that was in each Greek city-state. Okay? And that ecclesia carried out the rules of the whole kingdom. They 
collected taxes, they uh, had relief for the poor, welfare system, whatever needed. The, uh, uh, they provided for the armies, everything. That was all part of what they did. That's an old word. The word ecclesia was not, did not begin with Jesus. All right? You need to understand that. And the Church of England, when they translated the word ecclesia, where did the Church of England, the doctrines of the Church of England, where did it come from? The Catholic Church. All right, when Henry VIII wanted to divorce the, the uh, uh, from Catherine, Catherine of Aragon, the Pope said no. He finally kept whining and going on, wearing out ships, going back and forth to Rome. And, and he finally just said, well, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just take over all the churches in England, in England, Catholic churches, and we're going to change it back over to the Church of England. This is going to be a state church here. And he said, I'm going to be the Pope. And he said, I'll give myself a divorce if I want to. All right? And he did. He took, took over all the churches, the buildings, the pews, all the ornaments in them, lock, stock, and barrel. He kicked every priest out of England that would not go with him and established, and he put one Archbishop of Canterbury under him. And that was his ecclesi ecclesiastical head, but he was the head of the Church of England, and the Queen or the King of England today, of course, is the Queen. She is the head of the Church of England today. All right? Well, since they came out of the Catholic Church, what does the word Catholic mean? Universal. universal. All right. So they had an idea of this big universal church, and the head of that universal church was in Rome originally. Now it is in the castle. Yeah. Well, not, not in the Vatican, but in, in England. Okay, it's in, it's in the palace. All right, the royal palace. That's the head, okay? And he is the head of this church. And they look at the church as one big body. Okay, this universal church of England and the universal church of Rome. All right, wherever it goes out, that's part of that church. Well, the idea of the universal church, that's where it began with this. Okay? Now, to straighten this scripture out and untangle it now, we have to under, understand where all of this came from. Who's speaking? Jesus. Who's speaking in Matthew 16, 18? Jesus. 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 Who's he speaking to? Peter. Peter and? The and the church. church. Alright. He's speaking to Peter at first and then the church. Alright. Now he said in, the, in Matthew 16 and 18, uh, in the original language, and I'm going to translate this, he said, uh, and I also say to you that you are Peter, Petros, a small stone. That Petros is a small stone. Petra is a big stone. Big one. All right, bigger. We're going to find that out. That you are a small stone, but upon this great foundation's rock or stone, he uses the word, Jesus plays on words many times. Now, first of all, they knew what an ecclesia was, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Everybody in, in the whole Roman Empire knew what an ecclesia because, was because the Roman Empire had basically taken over where Greece had left off. And much of the Greece, Grecian culture had, had, uh, had been copied by the Roman Empire. Okay? He said, uh, <clears throat> and I also say unto you, Peter, you're a little rock. Okay, he uses the word petros, which means a small stone that you can pick up and throw. Okay, he said, but there's a kind you can look at up on page 208 in Benjamin Davidson's uh, uh, analytical Greek lexicon, and it'll tell you it can be used here as an adversity conjunction. It can be a conjunction, it can be a cumulative particle, many things, but here in this sentence, it is a a conjunction, a, an adversity conjunction, which means but. There is a stopping point. But, okay, but I say unto you, upon this rock, this gigantic rock, and then he says, oiko de mesa. He said, I shall be building up, doming up, is what it literally means, doming up the ecclesia of me. What is he talking about? When he used the word ecclesia, it's not the big idea of a church. All right. 
But what is it? People. Local body, local, independent, visible assemblies of people. Okay? I shall be building this up. Now, at this time there was only one assembly. But this assembly would multiply. When God created bees, the first time when He created the first beehive, what? How did bees do? What do they do? What's the life of a bee? My wife loves to keep bees. She, she likes bees, and I used to do that too. Now, what do bees do? Sting. Oh, they sting you <laughs> to protect themselves. You get the in church with a real Baptist, and they'll sting you occasionally. You don't behave. <laughs> They're workers. <laughs> They're workers, aren't they? They're workers. Bees are workers. And they have one queen. Alright? Baptists should have one queen. The Lord Jesus Christ. Alright? Yeah. And uh, when, the, when the hive gets too big, when there's too many workers, raised and everything else, uh, they, what would they call swarm. Some of them leave and some of them stay. And they, chart, they, they start a new beehive. Alright? All the way down. I remember old Ben Bogart saying that's the way, that's the way Baptists are like bees. They swarm and go and they can live in a hollow tree or an old hole in an old barn or in a real fancy uh, hive with supers on it or whatever. It don't matter. They can function in any place. All right. He said, I'll be building up this ecclesia, this uh, assembly of me. And then he says, and the gates of the unseen world shall not wrestle her down. Jesus made some real pointed axioms here, some real basic truths. First of all, he said, I'm going to be building my assembly, and I'm not going to found it upon Peter. I'm going to found it upon this gigantic rock. Now, where did Peter, what did Peter say that that rock was? What did Peter say that rock was? Remember? Yeah, yeah. Here in verse 16, it was uh, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son yeah. of the living God. Okay. Somebody turn to 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8 and read that for me, please. 1 Peter 4, 2, 4 through 8. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8. See, he's the fastest. 1 Peter 4, what? 1 Peter 2. 4 through 8. Just one page back. <laughs> you got there, to Tony? Yeah. Okay. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by man, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Okay, this stone would be precious, and he that believes upon this stone, who is this stone? Jesus. According to, to Peter, it's Jesus. It's not, according to the Catholic Church and many people out in Christian today, it is Peter, but it was not. Even Peter straightened that out, didn't he? If you want to go back in the Old Testament, he's quoting the Old Testament. And it talks about the Christ, the Messiah, Jehovah, becoming flesh and being the chief cornerstone of his assembly. So who is the big rock? Jesus. We got that one straightened out, don't we? All right. And, yes. Did they purposely mistranslate that to Anne because of the Pope? That was the Church of England's. Uh, if well, first of all, when King James says, when you translate this Bible, don't you translate anything that's contrary to what we believe? I'll kill you. And so, when you come to the word baptism, it's always going to be baptism. It's not going to be immersion. They, they, that was a, they had a council. What are we going to do with the word baptism? That means dip. And we aren't dipping. <laughs> you know, what are we going to do? And he said, well, don't translate it. Just throw it out there like that, and, and we'll make a right out of it instead of what it really is. If, when you read about John the, the Baptist in the, in the Bible, it should be John the Dipper. John the Immerser. Every time you, you uh, uh, see that word, uh, if you when you translate it in your home Bible study or when you're teaching, you say dip or immerse. That's what it's talking about. My wife and I, we were watching a, a, a movie yesterday about a, a, this rabbi was teaching about the ancient baptisms that Israel performed. Baptism didn't begin with John the Baptist. Israel was baptizing uh, 
for thousands of years before that. Every young woman that was to be married, she was baptized and died to her old family, would be raised anew to her new family. Uh, they say that Abraham, when he left the Ur of the Chaldees, he baptized all of his, uh, his possessions and his slaves because they were going to die to that old system and going to be raised anew and they were going to follow the Lord into a new land that he would give them. Uh, baptism in the Red Sea, so to speak. All right? All of those people that, uh, that were not in the ark, when that great big baptism of waters came to what we call the flood, what happened to those that weren't in Christ? They were baptized, but they never came up. <laughs> they'll be coming up there one of these days. <laughs> you know, they'll be coming up one of these days, but they were dead. They were baptized to death because they weren't in Christ. All right, you've got, to be, you've got to be saved first, in other words. All right, let's look at this, this verse just a little more. And he said, And the gates of hell, the gates of the unseen world, the word Hades comes from the word not to be able to see. Okay? Not able to be seen. The gates of the unseen world shall not wrestle my little assembly down. Jesus said here that his assembly would always exist through the church age. Now, the, the age of the law or the age of Israel was the preceding age that came before the church age, wasn't it? Hmm? Alright? And the age of the law or Israel, who was the administrator of God's kingdom during that time? Israel was. Alright? And it says that the law and the prophets were until John. John. All right. When John, the herald of the new king, came, Israel was done away with as the administrator of God's kingdom. They were over. Their job was finished because the king had come to take over. The king was Jehovah in flesh. All right. He had come to take over. Then he uh, <coughs> said the gates of hell will not prevail against her. That all during the church age, all during this period of time, which is called the age of grace of the church age, the church, church would exist. Now, according to a, a lot of the ecclesiastical world, because of what the Catholic Church did in the first three or four or five hundred years, they thought that all the true church had died out. And that yeah, during the Reformation, the church re-stuck re its head back up during the Reformation. Well, truth, God didn't need the Reformation at all. Because the truth was already already here. It had gone all the way down through the ages from the time. And if you go back and you'll study the history of these people that, that lived and fought uh, against the Catholic Church, and I don't mean with swords. They fought with the Word of God. They were called Montanists and Paulicians and, and uh, Donatists and, and uh, Novatians and many things that they were called and Waldenses down through those ages. But those churches existed because of the promise right here. Now turn to Matthew 28, 18-20. Alright? Matthew 28, 18-20. You think I'm preaching heresy this morning, young lady? <laughs> or is this truth? If you don't understand this truth, you're going to miss out a whole lot of things in the Bible. That's all I can say. You're not going to understand a whole lot of things. When it comes to the letters, the New Testament letters made to these churches. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Someone read that for me. Some of you, how many of you know my translation of that? Levi, can you, do you remember how I translated that? No. Oh, you don't? I bet Tony does. Tony, you remember how that I've uh, translated that one from the original language? All right. Is he, how about you, Ken? I've got it written. You've got it written down there. All right. How's that come out? Right. All, all, uh, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me. Who did he speak to? To his church. All right. Who's, it, who's speaking? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is speaking to his assembly now. Okay. Um, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Um, as you are going, therefore, make habitual learners of all nations, all ethnic the cities, dipping them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to 
hold closely and guard with their hearts all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the completion of this age. All right. And the, most people, most translations translate, some of them will say over the call, but this is incorrect. But most translations says, go ye therefore into the world. That's not what it really says. It says, after you've gone out into the world. After you are out in the world. Because it's a, it is an aorist participle. This is King after you, having gone out into the world, after you're gone, and how would they get out into the world? What would happen to the church after the day, after the day of Pentecost? <coughs> Here, the church was supposed to be waiting for the Lord in Jerusalem, and He said, "I'm going to send you a Comforter." All right, and that Comforter would come and empower them to go out into the world. What would cause this church to go out into the world? How do you remember? Persecution. Persecution. They scattered them all over the place. Paul started killing them. They stoned Stephen right out there by the, the sheep gate in, in, in Jerusalem. I mean, they were killing people just as fast as they could kill them. And, and uh, Paul was chasing all over the place. He was even going down there to, the, to Damascus to kill some more people that were members of churches and gather them up. Well, the church would be scattered and spread out, but Jesus has a promise here. I'll be with you until the end of the age. That's a promise. So that church has been here all through the ages. It didn't begin in the Protestant Reformation, reemerge its head, it didn't go out of existence because of the promise of God. That even believe the scriptures. And that's part of the scriptures. That's just as plain as it can be. Alright. Where are other where is another scripture that, that is so confounding to, to people? John the third chapter. Let's go and look at a so familiar scripture. Not sinning. Huh? Not sinning. Well, well, no, John, the third chapter. Oh, We're going to go and look at John. John. Yeah. Oh, John, well, yeah. First John, that's about sinning. Okay, John chapter number three. And this is so familiar to everybody. Everybody's heard John 3.16. I mean, just about everybody can quote John 3.16. But, do they know what it means? <laughs> Tony, can you read that for me, please? John 3.16? Yeah, no, John 3 and 1. John 3 and verse 1. There was a man of the, Pharise of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. All right, let's stop there just for a moment. The word Nicodemus means crowd buster. Crowd buster. The word Nicodemus means, it means, uh, uh, he, he's like a, a bouncer. <laughs> He was a uh, he's he was uh, like a guy that could go out and stop a unlawful assembly. Okay, of people. Nico means to conquer, and Deimos means basically a crowd of people. All right. To, to, he was a sergeant of arms. <laughs> That's what his name means. All right. That's uh, what he must mean. Nicodemus, yeah, a Pharisee. Now, first of all, he's a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a very it was the uh, it was the religious elite of Israel. Not very many people were Pharisees. Only like one in a thousand. Because they the word Pharisees comes from the, the, the Hebrew word Faris. And what does that mean? Many, many people you farce. Remember that one? The handwriting on the wall in the book of Daniel. Alright? You farce it means divided. Split, separated, set apart. Alright? They were set apart as very special, picked out people, they said, of God that were holier than everybody else. Here we've got a holy man. <laughs> we've got a holy man here in this thing, this Pharisee. And his name was Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. All right, uh, Tony, go ahead. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. All right, let's look at that one now. Uh, here we have a conversation between two individuals, and it's at night time. All right, who's speaking? Well, sometimes Jesus is speaking, sometimes Nicodemus is speaking. All right, and he comes and says unto Jesus. Now he's speaking to Jesus, and he said unto him, "What? What do you call him?" Yeah. Okay, how would you translate that to that, Master? Teacher. Some more than that. More than that. Doctor. 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 Doctor of letters. 
doctor of theology. He was a great, I mean, the highest degree that you you can in, in theology that you can get. There used to be two of them. I have those. I earned those two: doctor of Bible languages and doctor of theology. Okay, that was the two highest degrees in in, in theological orders. And that's what Jesus. That's what he called Jesus. Now, who is this guy? He's the super elite of Israel. And he says unto him, Rabbi, doctor, 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 rabbi, we know. Who is he a representative of? He said, we know. Wait a minute. I think it is. <laughs> what did he say? We know. Who's the we? Pharisees. The Pharisee sect. The religious leaders of Israel. We know that you are a teacher come from God. Why? What? Now go back to your little third column right here. There, look up there. Up that third column up higher. And what does it say? Right at the top of it. Miracles. Why were miracles uh, performed? To confirm the Word of God and they were Jesus' Messianic credentials. Alright. Let's get this straightened out. And we're going to find out a lot of things in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. This is very important because we're, you know, the Pope released Israel from, uh, from all uh, suspicion and condemnation from crucifying the Messiah here a few years ago. They just said, you know, that you weren't responsible. It was a Roman government thing. Okay. Uh, you did it ignorantly. Let's see how ignorantly they did. Okay. <laughs> Let's just see how ignorantly they did. We know that you're a teacher from the God and no man can do these miracles except God be with him. All right. So we have some things established here. We have Nicodemus, a representative of the Pharisees. He came to Jesus by night. It's dangerous to travel at night time. He wanted his whole attention. A lot of people say he's a coward and all this kind of stuff. But he wanted his whole attention. Nobody traveled at night time. You travel at night time, you might get killed. Anywhere, even in the cities. It was worse than in the ghettos. <laughs> like worse than Watson. East Bakersfield or whatever, you know, I mean, that traveling at night time, well, I mean, you go out there at night time, walk down the road, you probably get your throat cut or shot or something. Same thing happened back then, was a bunch of outlaws back then. Things haven't changed, people are still people, the Adamic nature is still alive, it hasn't ceased, all right. Now verse 3, young lady. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right. Jesus is teaching him. Uh, we, we, look at, we look at a scripture. We say, who's speaking? Who's he speaking to? What is the subject? Something else you've got to remember. What's the customs of the day? What was taking place right then? What, what, in, what conversation setting was this given? When was this? Around 30 AD? This period of time? He's talking to the one of the head representatives of the nation of Israel. Alright? And he's using common terms that this man uses, knows, and understands. Okay? He says, and said unto him, Verily, verily. He said, actually, Amen, Amen. Amen is a particle of affirmation in Greek. Alright? And it comes from uh, a Hebrew word. What's the Hebrew word? Amen. Okay, and that Hebrew word comes from the Persian word. What's that Persian word? Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> that's, that's real simple, isn't it? Comes through all of those languages and it's the same word. It originally meant to stand behind, to prop up, to, uh, uh, to ensure something. Now, when Jesus is reminding Nicodemus about what happened at Mount Sinai, every time that a law from the law of Moses when he came down off the mountain, every time that he read a law to the congregation of Israel, at the end of that, what were they supposed to say? 
Amen. Amen. All right. Then we'll do it. We'll stand behind. We'll stand behind the word. We will keep the law. That's what they said. Amen. Amen. Did they ever keep the law? No. The Pharisees said they did. Matter of fact, the Pharisees added three hundred to seven hundred more laws to the law of Moses. They were keeping laws that weren't even in the Bible. How many of you remember what some of those laws were? Some of the ridiculous laws that they had. How far you could travel on the Sabbath? How far could you travel on the Sabbath? What about walking across the grass? How much you, could carry you couldn't across walk across the grass on, on the Sabbath because you might sow seed off of it. Could you eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath by a hen or a dove mm -hmm. or a pigeon or anything? No, couldn't do that. All right. Could you help a man that was hurt and bleeding on the Sabbath, according to the Pharisees? No, you had to wait until the next day. You had to just kind of patch him up just a little bit. You couldn't heal him until the next day. You had to wait. It's good work. What's that? All right, these are some of the laws of the rabbis. These weren't the laws of God. They added to it and said, we're so good we can keep all of God's laws plus all of these laws that we invented. All right? That's what's going on here. Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, or amen, amen, I say unto you, now, it's an absolute fact, fella. <laughs> you say it at the end of the word, but I'm telling you, all men, all men, the beginning, because everything following all men, all men is an absolute fact. <laughs> all right. Except a man be born again. All right. Except anyone be born again. And the word is on nothing. It means born from above. Born again. He is not able to see the kingdom, the Basileon of God. He's not able to see the kingdom of God. Now, the, were these terms terms that Nicodemus understood? Mm -hmm. uh, well, what was being born again? Apparently, you remember what being born again was? Remember that rabbi yesterday? Mm -hmm. Zola Levitt. What did he say about that? Being born again. Well, when you're born again, your old sins are left behind you and you're, you have a new life. A new life. All right. Israel taught that, that you must be born again. Now, who, who, this was a term that was used of proselytes. Proselytes. When a proselyte came to Israel, he was a Gentile. All right. When one of these Gentiles came to Israel, First of all, they had to learn all of the necessary laws of God and, and, and they had to denounce their old ethnic heritage. Alright? Had to denounce all of that. And then they, uh, what else did they have to do? Cut their hair. Had to cut all their hair off, shave their heads, like a newborn baby, bald. Cut their fingernails all the way back, the toenail. Shave the hair off all their body so they'd be like a baby again. Then what happened to them? Then what had happened to them? Dip. They were dipped. In a baptismal font. It's called mitfah in Hebrew. They had these mitfahs all over Israel, baptismal fonts, where people were baptized that were proselytes. They died to their old nationality and were raised and born again, or born from above, to follow as a child of Israel. Jesus is not using any new terms to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is acting dumb. Have you ever seen somebody act dumb like they didn't know what you're talking about? <laughs> they acted dumb? That's exactly what's going on here. They're, they're acting dumb. Or he is. Matter of fact, all of them are acting dumb. He said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the the kingdom things of God. You couldn't see the kingdom of God. Now, who was Israel supposed to be? The administrators of what? The kingdom, the kingdom of God on earth. Today, the churches are administrators of the kingdom of God on earth. Alright? In Matthew 16 and verse 18, if you look in verse 19, it talked about handing the keys of the kingdom. Jesus handed the keys of the kingdom to his assembly. Alright? 
He said, you went to the assembly, I'm going to hand the keys of the kingdom to you, not Peter, by the way, but to that assembly. All right? You cannot understand, you cannot see, you cannot perceive the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. Israel would tell all the proselytes this very thing. He'd tell them all this very thing here. You cannot understand anything about God's stuff unless you're born again and you are baptized and you renounce your old nationality and you become born anew or born again into the family of Israel. Verse 4. Now, uh, tell me what's that one say. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? What a dumb thing to say. <laughs> this was real. This is like some lawyer on, uh, down in the courts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This was some... uh, asked you some stupid question. Asked you a question. You, you, the lawyer asked you something. Uh, where were you last Sunday night? And you say, and then he said, well, where were you last Sunday night? Where were you last Sunday night? Where were you last Sunday night? You sit there 40 different ways. See if you give him a different answer. And Nicodemus says here, and he, of course he was a lawyer. He was a lawyer. He studied the law and he was a lawyer. That's what Nicodemus was. He studied the law and, and he also was a rabbi, a doctor of the law. And he said, now he said, uh, how can a man be born again? You're not talking to me. You mean to tell me you're putting me in the same category as those proselytes out there? What was Jesus telling you? Your religion isn't good enough. Your religion has not saved you. You need a new religion. You need to be born again like you're telling these proselytes they need to be born again. The Pharisees went to John the Dipper out there on, in the Jordan River and they said unto him, we want to be baptized. We want to be dipped. And what did John tell them? <laughs> Who caused you to flee from the wrath to come? The Holy Spirit sure didn't convict you. <laughs> he can't touch your evil, wicked, hard hearts. He said, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, and then I'll dip you. And if a Pharisee was dipped, what would he say? What were you saying, brother? Really? In reality. That your old religion wasn't any good. Yeah. And you're putting on a brand new religion and a brand new, and you're you're going to follow the Messiah. Alright? And being born again. Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time? How foolish. What a stupid statement. You think it, it was stupid on purpose too. Because he didn't want to admit that he needed to be born again. Mm -hmm. Did he? Okay, number five. Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. All right. Jesus said unto him, and what did he say? Verily, verily, and what does that translate it from? Amen, amen. Again, he made a flat statement here. This is everything following is the absolute truth, fellow. That's what Jesus told him. He said, there's no lie in here. He said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. All right. Born out of water. All right. That's... Now, he, Nicodemus brought up the... the uh, uh, the, the simple fact that a, born, a man is born of water the first time. When a woman is about to have a baby, what happens? Water breaks. Water breaks. All right, her water, her, her water breaks when the child comes forth. Jesus was telling him, I know you're, you've been born once because you're born of water and you came out and here you are. You're born. You're, you're walking, breathing, walking on two legs. You look like Adam and you're related to Adam and, and you're Adam's descendant. But when you're born the first time, you're born to death. Alright, you're born to death. Alright. He must be born of water 
and of the Spirit. All right. What this? Uh, what is this Spirit here talking about? The soul. Huh? The soul. Oh, no, it's the Spirit. Nematos. Soul is suke. All right. Our nephesh. In the Old Testament. What is this Spirit here talking about? The Holy Spirit. Spirit. Born to God. The Holy Spirit. Let's go into soteriology now. Okay? What's soteriology? Are we getting, are we getting, we're boring you, Victor? That's <laughs> interesting. Soteriology is the study of salvation. Alright, soteriology is the study of salvation. How were the Old Testament saints, saved people, saved? Faith. Huh? Faith. By faith. Just like the New Testament saints. There wasn't anything different. When a person in the Old Testament was saved, the Spirit of God came into them and dwelt in their life, in their heart. They were born again just like you're born again today. There's not one bit of difference in Old Testament salvation and New Testament salvation, as far as that goes. The Spirit of God dwelled in all of those people. Now, where people get the misunderstanding is the Spirit of God came upon people in the Old Testament to guide them, to have them write by inspiration the Bible. Uh, some of the judges, the Spirit of God would come upon them and they would do a deed, and the Spirit of God then would leave them. We're not talking about, no, we're talking about the leadership of the Spirit now, as far as leading and guiding and inspiring. But salvation, the Spirit indwelling in people, they were indwelt with the Spirit of God in the Old Testament, just like you're indwelt with the Spirit of God in the New Testament. And this is something you will never understand unless you understand Matthew 16 and 18, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and all of these. Because what happened on the day of Pentecost was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon that assembly and immersed it in that Spirit. And that Spirit has been there in the Shekinah glory of God. It's still in those assemblies throughout all ages, through all, all the world. It only happened once. And that only happened one time. Okay? That spirit. And that was not salvation. Alright? So many in the charismatic movement today, uh, they want to believe that this is going to happen again, and that is a confirmation of salvation. It has nothing to do with salvation at all. Being born of the Spirit, when God's Spirit comes and dwells in you, and that is a down payment of your salvation, alright? Of the hope that you have in the future. That's God's Spirit is your down payment in you that He's going to redeem you. All right, that happened all the way from Adam this way. When well, He says, oh. "I'll send the, the Comforter," uh -huh. is, is that different from that? The Holy Spirit—that's a different work of the Holy Spirit. All right, when He said, "I'll send," them, He said, "Wait here, and I'll send the Comforter to you." Now, in the Old Testament, when Moses prepared the tabernacle, it was completely finished and prepared. And the Shekinah glory came with God, came on him and immersed the tabernacle. When, when Solomon built the, the temple, he did the same thing. The Spirit of God, after it was finished, the, game, the Spirit of God took possession of it and just immersed it in his Shekinah glory. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. God immersed that assembly in the Shekinah glory of God. And it has carried that Shekinah glory all through all ages, all the way through and it is in a special way in God's New Testament churches. All right? There's a lot of them been founded by man. It's not there. But that does not stop the work of the Holy Spirit, does it? Because Jesus says that not one word of His word would ever be done away with. And wherever, wherever any of the word of God is preached, the Holy Spirit of God will convict hearts of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. If a frog could croak the gospel people would be saved. Hmm. Just for instance, if you go to discovertheword.com on, on the, the World Wide Web, you can go up there and you can listen to uh, Martin Canavan. You can listen to uh, uh, many of my teachers. And they will preach the Word of God. Now that's no different than a frog croaking or a rooster crowing or anything else because those people are dead. All you're hearing is words. They were their words at one time, but they're not here anymore. All it is is a reproduction of that, those words. But what is the Holy Spirit of God going to do? 
It's going to so use that work. and it's going to save people mm -hmm. and convict people. All right. It's, now, it's the word. Yes. When they, um, the, one, the, uh, the Holy Spirit came, it was a convicting spirit at the, back then before in the Old Testament, Testament yeah. it was a convicting spirit mm -hmm. that convicted them to believe in the Messiah that was to come yes. looking forward mm -hmm. to where we look back to yeah that. here's the cross of Calvary all these people here look forward to the cross so the conviction of that Holy Spirit was, was to in convict their hearts. them to look forward to the day and when they when they believed it sealed them in the Old Testament they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise in the Old Testament. God said that God preached the gospel unto Abraham. What is the gospel? The good news. The good news. 1 Corinthians 15 chapter. The good news of the coming of the Messiah. Okay? And that he would die for our sins. Yes. Well, what do we do with the, the verse that says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. And then there was no power in any and of those. In the blood that was a sacrifice, there was no power in that blood. Yeah. So what do we do with the... There was no power in that blood at all. No. The power was in believing. The power was in the was believing, believing of the that blood. God would, would forgive them if they went by His way, by His orders. Okay. If they did this, then God would forgive them. The, the, the lambs of bulls and goats and sheep and doves never washed away sin. It was the promise that their sins would be washed away. The promise of God. And the word is, is, is the word is elpis or elpidia. Uh, it, it means uh, it means hope. The few, the belief of something that is future is supposed to take place. The absolute belief that God will do it. If uh, and I used this example before when Indiana Jones he was going through in the in the and the the last crusade when he walked out there and he and he went like that on that uh, uh, invisible, invisible bridge, bridge. Yeah. he believed you know and that was a that was a type of belief it, because the, that belief caught him and he walked across okay that's believing you can't see it. And even though the bulls of blood, the blood of bulls and goats did not wash away sin, they were a type of the real blood that would wash away sin. Because we're washed in the blood, and we're cleansed in the blood, and there's power in the blood, all of these old things, but not in the blood of bulls and goats. So he goes back them. to the, the blood that Jesus shed on the cross mm -hmm. and believe, and they, we look forward back, they look forward to the blood that was to be shed. Yeah, that's right. That's and the, the way conviction. Uh, both was uh -huh. basically the same. Salvation has always been the same. It has not, it has not changed. There are some things that have changed. In the Old Testament, the saints always looked down when they looked toward death. We, when we look at death as children of God, we look up. All right. When they prayed in the Old Testament, they prayed to God, the Almighty God. When we pray in the New Testament, Jesus taught us to say. Father. Not the He's the same Almighty God. But in the Old Testament, they didn't have God as a Father. In the New Testament, Jesus said, You say Father. Because the work is done. The work is done. They look down. They look down because the, the holding place, the paradise of God, and that comes, that's also another word, paradiso. Uh, uh, and if you've looked at Perez, all of these in the Old Testament times, this word paradise meant a, a, a guarded pleasure park. That's what the word paradise meant. It come all the way through all those languages from, from Chaldee into Hebrew and then Hebrew and the Greek and Greek into English, and we still have the word paradise. All right? It's a guarded pleasure park. And in the Old Testament, it was referred to as Abraham's bosom, and somewhere it was down. That paradise was down. But heaven, where we're going today, when Jesus, he, he descended into, into paradise and into hell because it was one place at one time. Paradise and hell were one place. It was something like this. 
a sphere, here's the earth up here, and someplace down here was paradise. You have to remember that even though these people looked forward to the coming of Christ and the forgiveness of sins, their sins had not been forgiven in time and space until Jehovah became flesh and did die in time and space for them, for their sins. They always looked down to this place. Here was Abraham's bosom over here, and here was Sheol on this side. Sheol, or Hades. Alright? On this side was hell, and on this side was Abraham's bosom, which was paradise. Now when Jesus descended into hell, or this area, he went down there and he said he preached unto these people and told them that he had overcome them. The promise was done. It had been done. And then when he rose from the dead, it was absolutely completed. Jesus died for our sins, but he was raised for our justification. Okay? He had to go through the whole thing. You know, a lot of people want to say that Jesus died for your sins. Like the whole witnesses, you know, Jesus died for their sins as far as they're concerned. But he never rose. They're baptized into a dead Jesus. That's right. Baptized to a dead Jesus. And when you're baptized into death, you're baptized into death, not into life. You baptize, they say that Jesus the man <coughs> was the Savior and he came to this earth. He was an Archangel Michael and when he died, they don't know what happened to his body. It must have just dissolved or whatever because it never rose. So they don't believe in baptism? They don't believe in baptism, yeah. But they're baptizing people to death. You baptize people into that religion, you baptize them into hell, into death, because there's no resurrection. And without a resurrection, there is no salvation, is there? Now, the, de the Lord founded one system of faith and teaching. The devil founded hundreds. Simple as that. Baptized unto death. If we're baptized unto Jesus, unto Jesus' death, unto the water, when you, if you leave you down in the water, what happens? You drown. What happened on the outside of that ark? They died. You've got to come back up out of that water, typifying his resurrection. All right. There is no baptism without resurrection, is there? It's only a baptism of death. All right. Yeah. Uh, again, now he. When I know that when he went down, he he preached to them. It's, it said got, that there were sometimes the disobedient. I know he got the keys. He went down into hell. This region. The infernal region, whatever you want to call it, wherever it was. I think it's down below the earth someplace. Out in space. Here's the earth up here, and here's his place. Okay? And he preached unto them that were sometimes disobedient. During the church age, right here, that we live in. We preach the gospel. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Okay? There's a lot of churches out not preaching the gospel. They're only preaching half of it. And people are still dying and going to hell. With but after the rapture is going to be the biggest revival that the earth has ever known for a long time. After the rapture, there are going to be two in the field. One is going to be taken one is going to be left. Okay? There's going to be a great spiritual revival. But these people are going to have to die for their belief then. Because the Antichrist is going to come on soon. And he is going to demand that they take his mark. And he's going to, there is going to be public execution. The Bible, the book of Revelation that we teach on Wednesday night, talks about the public execution. What is the form of public execution? It even tells. What is it? Behaving. They're going to be beheading people on public execution. To scare people to death when they see somebody behead. A lot of blood and gut and gore going on there, you know. Well, this is what the forum is, and people are going to see this all over the world. Okay? Well, the uh, that period of time, there's going to be people saved after the rapture. What happened on the outside of the ark when the flood came and the rains came that they'd never seen before? What do you think took place on the outside of the ark? They believed. A lot of believing people scratching and clawing at the ark, but it was too late. 
God shut the door. God shut the door. God is going to shut the door at the rapture. They're going to have to die for what they believe now. Mm -hmm. A lot of people believed on the outside of that ark. But they died. And the ark is a type of the rapture. Brother Levine. This, the verse you're, you're talking about is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 to 8, 9, and 10. Yeah, read that for me read, real quick. So, what is it? But unto everyone who will give it. Okay, wait, let me start with you. Wherefore he have, when he has ascended upon high, he led the captive, captivity captive uh -huh. and gave them gifts unto men. Now he has ascended with what he is, but, but he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. And he has descended into the same also, ascended up far above all heavens, and that he might fill of all things. All right. He did this. When he died, he went down to this region. He rose, and he took these people with him. He took them to heaven. And the Bible says, during Christ's time, when he rose from the dead, something else happened to the graves, many of the graves of the saints in Jerusalem. What happened? These people absolutely were resurrected. And they walked among. They saw the resurrection, the first fruits of the resurrection. Okay? And it must have scared those people to death. Because what happened on the day of Pentecost? Thousands of people were saved. And then what do you think the Jewish religion did? <laughs> they, I, do you think... We're still in John, the third chapter now. We're going to go on down with it. We're going to finish in just a second when they turn loose out here. I'm going to turn you loose. We're going to go on John, the third chapter next week, next Sunday morning. And we're going to find out how bad these people, this religion was in Jesus' time. These people that this man represented, do you think he took and told them what happened during this meeting at night time? Do you think he went back and represented? He said, we know that you are a teacher sent from God. We. He went back. Who was another man that was a Pharisee? Paul. No, he shared Jesus' bed. Uh, uh, his, Joseph. Joseph, our yeah. Alright. You know, Jim, on the Holy Spirit and how he instructs, and I, I've always gotten the thrill out of this, uh, when Jesus prayed to his father, to Father, to God, I thank the old Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things, uh, from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto the babes. Yep. In other words, uh, the, the Pharisees couldn't understand that with head knowledge. Well, they didn't want to either. Uh -huh. They don't, you know, I've heard people, I've had people listen to me preach and I try to do a really good job of preaching the truth and the gospel. I really try my dead level best but I've had people just walk away lost blank stare. And just with a blank stare. And I try to make it so... Mm -hmm. I try to untangle it. I always say I'm a dumb Indian. And if I can understand anything, I hope that I can get you a little more intelligent than I am to be able to understand what I'm trying to tell you. Because if I ever untangled it, boy, anybody can untangle it. <laughs> can you imagine the Holy Spirit coming and these people being saved who can't read a, a word, you know? And that's why Jesus is talking about in babes, yeah. not not little babies. But. Well, who was following is who was following Jesus? We're gonna who was the who was the ones that the 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 Samaritans, Innocent. the descendants of Joseph, by the way, were the were the Samaritans. They were half breed Jews. They're all messed up religiously and everything, but they believed Jesus. And the whole cities were pouring out back in John the fourth chapter, the next chapter of John. They poured out to him to hear him, and they were ready, and they wanted, they wanted to. Wow, they were just so happy that he had come to them yeah. and told them the truth. Yes, sister. Um, you know, we say that Jesus was in the grave for three, three days. Uh -huh. Actually, he wasn't, you think? I mean, I think instantly, he instantly he went, you think, down. He wasn't, he wasn't a happy. I think Jesus was probably crucified on Wednesday. And he rose, or, or, he rose on Sunday morning. Early. That's what I believe. Yeah, yeah, I do too. But I mean, do you believe that he? Uh, in, at what point did he go down? Instantly after? 
what, uh, from the time that when 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 he went down to here, yeah, was when he said it is finished on the cross. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, what, what, we as yeah. we as we're made in the image of God. When you die, you don't cease being. You don't go to sleep. You don't whatever. You go right straight to heaven or right straight to hell. So, so that, ex that explains the fact that he said, told the thief that this day shalt thou be with, be me, with in me in paradise. paradise. That so day. he went with him at that instant. Well, he went with him later. Because that thief was killed later. But that very day. But it was the yeah, day. That it day. was that very day. Yeah. Later, you know, they they uh, they broke the thief's leg. The, the one that would bleed, they broke his leg so, leg so he would suffocate. Yeah. Because they had to push themselves up to exhale and to get another breath with their legs on that cross. They were hanging there all out of joint and everything. And, and they, the only way that they would stay, stay alive for days sometimes, but if they broke their legs, they couldn't push themselves up and down so they would die. You know, and after they broke his legs, and but Jesus' legs didn't need to be broken. They stuck Goliath's sword in his side. The Jews ran and got that sword and said, stab me with this one, this will really kill him. <laughs> you know, that had power in it. You know, well, let's let's be dismissed, and and uh, I'll turn you loose. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the lessons we've learned. Apply them to our hearts and help us to serve you as we go out this week. Forgive us for your failure. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you all of you for your endurance. <laughs> Oh, oh uh, hold on just a second. Oh, we're, we're sharing with the next class. Oh, okay. next class. Okay. So go okay. ahead. Oh. <laughs> we just got here early. Yeah, put up with old George Middleton. Oh, is that who it is? <laughs> so they didn't tell us who the teacher was, they just told us the class. Amen. Oh, George.